Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining us for our webinar today, Social Media 101 for Nonprofits with Adobe Spark. Before we get started, I just want to go over a few housekeeping items, so all callers will be muted. If you have questions, feel free to use the chat box that you see on the left-hand side of your screen. If you have to drop off early or if you want to watch the webinar again, we'll be hosting it on our website at techsoup.org slash community slash events dash webinars. We'll also be sending an email with the presentation, the recording, and any relevant links. Um, if you're on social media, feel free to tweet at us using at TechSoup, using hashtag TSWebinars, but like I said earlier, we'll be using the chat box that you see on the left-hand side of your screen. Uh, so before we get started, I just want to tell you a little bit about TechSoup. We are located in 236 countries and territories, serving over 1.1 million nonprofits around the world. We partner with several technology companies like Adobe, Intuit, Microsoft, and several more that you see here to make our mission of donated or discounted technology possible. If you are interested in finding out if your nonprofit is eligible, you can use the link that you see here, and my colleague Stephen will be dropping this link uh, in the chat box if you are interested in finding out if your organization is eligible. And uh, because today's webinar is focused on Adobe, we do have an Adobe donation program that you can see here. Um, you can see all the different offerings that we have with Adobe, and also uh, Stephen will be putting this link in the chat box as well if you're interested in um, getting some Adobe uh, software once the webinar is over. So before I make introductions, I just want to make sure that you guys can hear me okay and that the chat box is working. So if you don't mind just typing in what city you're calling in from, and I'll read out a few just to make sure you guys can hear me. Okay, so we have New York, Greensboro, Lancaster, Ohio, DeKalb, Illinois, There's a couple of San Francisco people here, that's where I'm at, and Veronica as well. Okay, so it seems like you guys can hear me okay. Awesome. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and make introductions. So uh, my name is Seema Tucker. I am the Senior Manager of Content here at TechSoup. I have my colleague Steven Davidson. He is helping on the back end with the um, technical chat. And we also have Emily Corbin who's going to be answering any Adobe related questions that you have on the back end. And we have our main presenter today, Veronica Belmont. So Veronica has worked as a podcaster, a voice actor, and an on-screen media personality, and she definitely knows a thing or two about what it takes to reach the masses. At Adobe, she is a product manager and evangelist on the Adobe Spark team, where she works to help, uh, help social media creators, marketers, influencers bring their brands and creative ideas to the masses. So that being said, I'm going to pass it off to Veronica. Thank you so much, Seema. How's everybody doing today? I'm so happy to be here. I see we've got some uh, Diamond Club fans in the audience. Hey, Keith. Um, I'm going to be keeping an eye on the chat as well uh, as we go through this presentation today. Um, but yeah, I'm really excited to, to chat about social media marketing best practices, uh, talk a little bit about what Spark does and how you can use it in your day-to-day -day lives, uh, both professionally and personally. And yeah, it's going to be really fun. And we'll have a couple of polls during the presentation as well. Um, and also uh, we'll have some time for questions at the very end. Uh, but also, as Seema mentioned, feel free to jump ahead and, and uh, ask some questions in the chat pod, and we'll get to them uh, throughout the presentation. Um, so yeah, Social Media 101, uh, really figuring out not only what it takes to have a conversation with your users online, but also visually how to tell that visual story uh, through the platforms that work best for you and your message. Um, so I've been with Adobe Spark for the past year and a half or so. Um, primarily I work on the uh, visual uh, – sorry, um, I, I work on the team that helps people discover the value uh, within the product, uh, learn about what's new, learn about what features we have. But also as an evangelist, I go out in there into the world and talk to social media marketers and people who are trying to tell those stories and figure out what best way to do that. Um, but before we get started, let's jump into a little poll. Um, here we go. And let me know how familiar you are with Spark. Is it something that you've used uh, in your professional life? Have you not heard of it? Have you seen it uh, with part of your Creative Cloud subscription? So just take some time and fill out that poll, and that will help me better understand kind of where we are with our, with our demo today. 
So it seems like uh, as the answers come back in fast and furiously, most of you have never heard of it, which is totally fine. And that's going to be really helpful for me as I describe like, how you can best use it. Uh, Donald says he doesn't understand Spark. That's okay too. <laughs> we can walk through some of that. Um, but mostly this is going to be about best practices in general that you can use whether or not you're using Spark. Um, but of course, it's always nice to, to get in there. All right, there's our, our poll so far. Uh, most of you have never heard of it. Some of us have uh, heard of it but not used it yet, um, have used a little bit. Perfect. So I've already talked about myself a little bit here today. Um, so Spark is really essentially a platform that allows anyone to create stunning social content in mere minutes. Um, and essentially we have three different versions of the app. We have Spark Post, we have Spark Page, and we have Spark Video. And all of those really come together to tell, help you to tell a cohesive visual story online. And so Spark Post is primarily for creating visual graphics. So that's content that you're going to host on Twitter or on Facebook or Instagram. Um, we also have iOS apps that allow you to create right from the content on your phone and post it to social networks automatically. Spark Page is really good for creating microsites, landing pages, newsletters. Think of it as like a really easy kind of WYSIWYG, WYSIWYG uh, website builder essentially. And then Spark Video. Spark Video is a tool for creating video content. And what I love about Spark Video is that you can really think of it as a tool where you don't need video content to create video. And that seems like a really basic concept, uh, but you have tons of photos, you have text, you have icons. Um, Yes, as Mary Jane says, it is, uh, Spark Post is very similar to Canva, um, but we're more within the overall like, Adobe ecosystem. So if you're already on Creative Cloud, you can use Spark automatically. I'll try not to digress too much from my original <laughs> storyline. I love getting distracted by questions, so I'm going to stay focused. Uh, but Spark Video enables you to create and edit and post videos uh, in mere minutes using the content that you already have out there. So why does design matter? Um, take a moment to think about a recent post that you commented on or shared or, or uh, even more powerfully one that really encouraged you to take action. And I think that's really the core of what we're trying to get to today. How can you encourage your followers, your community out there in the social media world to take an action on your behalf or for your behalf? So chances are that post that really drove you to take action was probably pretty well designed. It, was, it told a great story. It, it moved people to, to do something. And this is really backed by data actually. And a recent study shows that people are 65% more likely to engage with posts that have images. Now just think about that for a second. All it takes is to find a great image to kind of drive people towards doing something on your behalf. So humans are really hardwired to prioritize visual information, and, and great graphics are going to affect how your audience understands and retains that overall message. So in the context of your nonprofit out there, this really translates into things like better ROI on campaigns and fundraising efforts, uh, expand engagement and interest from those communities that you really want to connect with, either your community that you've already started to develop and create, or communities out there that have really shown to be in line with your existing objectives and goals. And finally, a really fun and memorable social media account will help you build that fan base of followers. And you're also going to be able to create a, a system of evangelists for your own company or nonprofit or project that you're trying to put out there into the world. So it sounds like maybe people are having a hard time understanding me. I'm not sure why. It sounds like things were working pretty well initially. Yeah, I think um, we're, we're going to send out, uh, if you guys are having a hard time hearing, we're going to send you a, a phone number to dial into in case um, it could be the, the computer connection. So we'll send that out in the chat box. Okay. Great. Yeah, I'm, I'm in over the phone, so I'm not using the, the, the network connection. So hopefully I should be okay. Um, all right. Well, I'll keep moving forward, and maybe people can dial in. It sounds like some people can hear me, other people not. <laughs> all right. Moving on a little bit to the next slide. Um, so this is an example of a typical kind of uh, social media engagement post that you would see on a Facebook, for example. Now the, the option on the left-hand side, uh, great. It's got a ton of information, not necessarily super eye-grabbing. The picture on the right-hand side, though, it, it 
gives a, a feeling. It kind of evokes an emotion. Um, and that's going to really encourage people to, to engage with your content and to remember what you're about. All right. Your design best practices. Um, this is really what you need to do. Uh, what you need to do is you don't need a ton of resources really to make good design, good social content happen. What you actually need is a plan. So we're going to walk you through some best practices and takeaways that are going to guide you through those kinds of plans. So the number one thing that I usually talk about is showing and not telling. Um, this is a super important piece of engagement information because at the end of the day, you have only milliseconds to really capture people's attention when they're scrolling through their feed. Think about when you're, you're on Instagram, for example, or you're on Facebook. Sometimes you only have a couple of minutes to actually engage with content. Maybe it's while you're waiting for the bus or, or you're in, in between meetings at work at the office. Uh, if you see something that's super compelling, it's going to encourage you to stop and engage with the content and actually read what's in the, the rest of the message. So you want to be able to create some stopping content. This is really the key. Um, and there's a lot of different ways that you can do that. Primarily having great visuals, having things like animation built in. That's something that you can do with Spark uh, with animation on post iOS. Um, that's a new feature that we launched recently. Uh, anything that's going to grab someone's attention and pull them into the rest of the information. So a clear image is super important. The descriptive copy in the actual post is also going to help people take action. Uh, so this is a great example of a back to school campaign uh, that the New York Public Library was doing. And there's a kind of great balance that you need to find between putting information in the captions of an image but also not overwhelming people. Um, you don't want to put too much information that it goes below the fold and people have to actually click more. You really only have about 126 or so characters before it goes below the fold and people have to click more in order to, to read the rest of the content that's in the caption. So keep it short and sweet. Um, if you want to have someone go through uh, to click on a CTA in your profile, that's one way to move people on to, to get more information about your nonprofit or guide. But really having that compelling, clear image that's going to grab their attention is the number one key. Let's talk a little bit about the power of copy uh, within a social media post. Um, this is a fantastic example because there's a, a tool that we use called visual hierarchy in the design world. Naturally, your eyes are going to go up and to the left. And this is kind of different from how we typically read like copy in a book or in a magazine. Um, but you'll see this time and time again in companies that are really engaging with their audience and getting those clickable, exciting posts out there on social media. So you want to have your primary, like your head and desk, like right there in the upper top left. Uh, the big text naturally is going to be the most eye-catching. That feels very obvious, but you want to make sure to really capitalize on what you want the primary message. Um, all right. So color and contrast is another important one. Uh, when you have an image on your screen, uh, one big tip is to darken the image actually. So it feels kind of counterintuitive, but whatever you can do, to make the text really pop and contrast against the image is going to help people identify the copy and, and really retain the information. And making good use of white space as well, we'll show some examples of this in the next, uh, in the next slide as well. Um, do you want me to call in over Skype or something? Would that be helpful? Okay, we could try uh, that's something. okay. It sounds, like, it sounds like people are calling in and they're getting a better – I think it's a little bit um, staticky, but overall it's fine. So I, I think we're good. Okay. All right. So here are some examples um, from some different organizations. Uh, actually, one that we worked with, Wonder Dog Rescue over here on the right-hand side. Um, this graphic is a perfect example. Um, huge copy. It's got great contrast. It's got these visuals that really pop. Uh, and it's also branded. And branded is something that we're going to talk about a little bit more in the presentation um, to really make your message online cohesive and consistent over time. This is a huge point uh, that I try to make when working with not only small businesses but also nonprofits. Um, if you have a message that you're trying to get out there, being consistent over time is probably the number one tip for being recognizable across different social platforms. Uh, Bill says, what shows up better, light type on a dark background or dark type on a light background? 
Um, it depends on actually the color of the background. Uh, another thing to keep in mind is accessibility. Um, so as long as you do have that contrast, it shouldn't really matter. Um, one thing to note in this image on the left-hand side, the Donate Today to Everyone Plays org, um, there is a little bit of brightness behind the, the text there, and that can make it a little more difficult to read. Um, I think if perhaps they had flipped this image um, and actually flipped it on the horizontal axis so that the runners instead were running to the right uh, from left to right instead of right to left, then that dark corner in the upper right would be behind the text, and that way it would have popped even better um, without having to do too many changes uh, for the actual image itself. But yeah, I think as long as the contrast is there and as long as it's popping against the image, uh, it doesn't really matter whether or not the background is light or the text is light. I mean, you can see here in these two examples, they are actually almost polar opposites, uh, and they're both really easy to read. Type and color is another really big one. Uh, type can actually be one of your secret weapons. Um, so in this example for Save the Whales, uh, this is actually the, the typeface and the content that is giving that message. It really is helping to set the tone of what you're trying to convey. And all of these images on the next slide too, they're really trying to create a mood or a feel. Um, and it's really just as important to your design as the message itself. Um, so think about ways that you can use once you can use the type stage um, to be a part of the overall image, the overall feel uh, in your campaign or in your social uh, content. So this is an example kind of of what not to do. Um, in this example, we have just way too much copy here. The contrast isn't good on some of this. It's not branded. You're really losing, losing the message of what it's trying to say. And so I see a lot of posts online that look very similar to this. And it's not going to do you any good. It's not going to help get that message across. Off. All right, so we were talking about uh, best practices. And we were talking about these two examples that we were looking at here. Um, and there were some great questions and conversations about like what works best. Is it best to have a light background? Is it best to have a dark background? Honestly, it, it doesn't really make a difference. It, it's all kind of, as long as the contrast is there, as long as the words are legible. Um, and some of the tips that, that I typically say are, be okay about darkening the background. Like don't worry about it too much. This is something that I do all of the time. Um, so essentially, if I'm in Spark, for example, if I'm in Spark on the web or I'm in Spark on my iOS app, uh, I will actually use one of the filters called Darken. And essentially, all it does is just put a layer of transparency over the top. And that way, any copy, any text that you're putting on top of those images is going to really pop. And we'll see some examples of that further in the presentation. So if we move on uh, to talk about type and color, um, have some fun with it. Uh, this is something, especially if you have like really fun, engaging brand colors, um, you can use them in really interesting ways. Uh, so this Save the Whales example, this is using typeface, essentially, to make a statement. Um, it's using contrast. It's using color. It's extremely engaging. And it still has that CTA built in in the upper left where eyes are going to go. The question from Janelle is, should you deviate from your nonprofit's brand fonts? Um, this is really up to you and your organization. Um, so if you have a brand guideline kit, if you have a setup that your design team has put together that you're supposed to follow, um, have a conversation uh, with them about how much you can have a little bit of wiggle room on that. Um, I think for something like this, for example, uh, your brand fonts probably won't work. Um, but on the other hand, some people are really strict. I mean, I have seen some brand guidelines that are just so completely over the top uh, to be stifling in a way. Um, but yeah, have a conversation with them. Figure out what the wiggle room availability is. Um, but sometimes you can find uh, different typefaces, for example, that go really well or contrast with your brand font. And those can be the ones that you can have a little bit more fun with. So say, for example, that your brand font is, font is uh, like sans serif. Um, maybe go with the serif font that's going to contrast well against that. But be consistent is what I'm trying to get at. Uh, if you do have something that you're using that can contrast against your existing brand font or treatment, um, make sure that is the contrasting font that you use throughout your social uh, posts. That way it's still 
in your guidelines, it's still something that people are going to recognize, but you still have a little more flexibility. All right, now this is a what not to do. Um, there's a lot of what not to do's out there in the world, uh, but this is something that I see a lot. Um, it's got way too much copy. Uh, the background shape is obscuring some of the image. Uh, the text that we have for volunteer, join our staff, sponsor, donate books. Um, not only is it, <laughs> this has different sizes, it has different spacing, um, it's very difficult to read. So just think about these kinds of examples out there. You want people to look at an image and really see exactly what you want them to do, what action you want them to take. These are some uh, really wonderful examples uh, from Instagram stories um, using great use of text, uh, iconography, imagery. Um, here on the right-hand side, we have that picture of the owl. The image has been darkened so that the text really pops. Uh, authentic, uh, authenticity and consistency um, is kind of like a game that I love to play. Uh, you know, if, if you can count the number of times that I say authenticity during one of these presentations, uh, were it to be a drinking game of some kind, um, we'd all have a pretty healthy buzz by the end of the presentation. But consistency is the number one tip. That is really the thing that we're trying to get at um, across the use of brand colors, brand typefaces and fonts, uh, imagery that you use. Uh, this all comes back to creating that thumb-stopping content that's going to make people pay attention. Uh, so here for Pencils of Promise, you can see that even with their Instagram stories, they're using very similar iconography and imagery um, to have that consistent look and feel. And in their posts, that Trevor Noah post, for example, still using the same font and typeface and color imagery. Um, so this is a really great example of having that widespread brand look and feel across not only the images that you're using on Instagram and in your social posts, but also in the makeup of your profiles. Um, here's another example. Um, I think this is really beautiful. Um, this is just showing how you can, again, take all those iconography. Uh, we have access to the Noun Project, um, which we'll talk about a little later in the presentation, which gives you access to hundreds of thousands of different icons that are license-free and able to use. Um, so you can see in the upper left post, for example, um, these icons, they're using the brand color and treatment. Um, but you can have some uh, added additional excitement and interest to the social posts that you're creating. Um, this is actually bordering for me on a little bit too much text on the social post. Uh, that's okay as long as it's not always going to be like that. But just pay attention to how much you're filling up the space and how much time people are actually going to devote to reading the content uh, in your Instagram post. So here is what the brand uh, manager in Spark currently looks like. Um, and so what we do is enable you to import your logo, uh, typically a PNG file, uh, add your color palette options. If you have a specific hex colors that you work with, you can type them in here. So you never have to worry about not having your colors be consistent. And then your custom typefaces. So we're going to suggest font pairings that you can use when you import your, um, your logo. But if you have something very specific that you're already using, you can import those font files. And then we're going to generate a number of different templates that you can use for your brand, uh, whether it be for social media, for print, all different types of options that are all going to be in line with your brand content. And on that note, I was really curious to know, how important is custom branding to you? Is this something that you really think about? Is your organization very focused on having that consistent looking feel across all of your social posts and platforms? Um, start letting me know. I'm very curious to see. Um, sometimes people don't necessarily feel that it's important enough to pay for, or sometimes it's like a make or break it kind of feature, like they must have that brand consistency. It typically depends on the size of the organization, how far along they are. Um, but it sounds like most of you think it's important, but not necessarily enough to pay for. OK, that's cool. And other of you are saying it's somewhat important. So let's take a look at these results as they're coming in. Very cool. Um, I do want to kind of drive in the point that branding, you know, whether or not you use it as a paid feature, you can achieve that whether or not it's through putting your logo on post, uh, through other options like using consistent coloring and typefaces too. 
Another thing uh, that I really think is important is figuring out what platforms work best for the kinds of content that you're creating. Uh, we call these platform rules. Uh, if you look at Nike, for example, uh, they do a really, really wonderful job of this. Um, so what they're actually doing is figuring out different content types for different platforms. Not all platforms are going to be created equal for your nonprofit. Uh, some nonprofits really like to use Instagram because they're much more visual. Um, others use LinkedIn because they maybe have more of a business angle to uh, the customer base and the people they're trying to reach. But you want to be able to tailor that content to the type of platform that you're using. Nike uses LinkedIn, for example, to talk about their employees. I think this is a really great strategy. Uh, you can highlight the people that are working in your nonprofit organization and talk about their specific roles and how they make an impact. Um, Facebook tends to be more conversational with your user base. So if you have a strong number of users on that platform, it's a really great spot to, to ask questions and to start conversations. Um, we use that primarily for our Spark Insiders group. That's where we kind of launch new features and talk about things that we're working on in beta. Um, but our community there is super strong. And then visually, um, for, for Instagram, uh, Spark <laughs> in particular, we're a very visual kind of company. Um, so we use that primarily for sharing what you can do with the product and showing examples from our community. Um, Instagram is a great, great place for hosting user-generated content, um, and more on that in a little bit. So uh, we should be on the let it breathe slide right now. Um, so hopefully if the, the presentation is caught up, you should be seeing a girl on a like little stone uh, sitting looking over the mountain. That's where we're at in the presentation right now. Um, this is an important point. Uh, and one of the mistakes that I make most frequently, um, should we let it uh, catch up with the, the slide presentation right now, or should I keep moving forward and it will catch up as time goes on? Uh, since this is visual, I want to yeah. make sure that we're Okay. I think uh, for most people it should be caught up. It could be some people's internet connection if it's a little okay. slower. So yeah, you can just keep going. Okay. Seems like most people are seeing the. Let me let me jump back to the Nike slide real fast so you can see see that example for those who didn't get a chance to see it. Maybe there was just a a clog in the internet tubes, as they say. So there's the Nike slide, and we'll share out all of this uh, after the the webinar as well. And here's our young woman, let it breathe slide. And this is something, especially if you're at an event or if you're doing something live, um, remember to let your visuals breathe. Uh, this, this is uh, something, like I said, that I do wrong all the time. I'm always like exactly centering my photographs. I'm always getting the main subject right there in the middle. And that makes sense when you're just sharing things with no text or copy. But when you actually want to add that, you leave out optionality. So suddenly, if, if, this, if this young woman, for example, was centered, then my text would be blocking her. We'd be covering up part of the most important part of the, of the image. And so we want to leave a little room. Uh, this is like very similar to what many of you have heard uh, through other contexts as the rule of thirds. Um, so make sure you leave some space for your copy to breathe within your images. This is less important for things like LinkedIn or Facebook, for example, where you're putting more content actually in the, in the, uh, in the, why can't I never remember that word? I'm trying to think of the caption. <laughs> I'm losing words today. It's still early in San Francisco a little bit. I'm ready for my, oh, you're right. This, it is spelled, it's spelled wrong. This, it's like a vista. It's, it's a, you know, it's, it's slang, right? Uh, visit our national parks. This is not a real campaign. This is something I made, so that's on me. Um, but this is just a good example of how, of how you can do that. You want to leave, leave in optionality. Um, so Andrew says, optionality and consistency seem in contradiction. Um, it depends on the kind of optionality I think you're talking about. Um, I'm ta consistency, you don't always have to have your copy in the same. Okay. We're kind of talking about two different things here. I'm talking about leaving optionality in your imagery for putting in your text, and consistency is really what I'm talking about when we're talking about the, the, uh, the fonts, the branding, the color options you're using. Um, those you want to stay consistent with. Um, 
this is an example of your the up and to the left optionality that we were talking about, but I'm just saying give yourself some optionality about where you can put your text in later, if that makes sense. Uh, like if this were centered, you wouldn't be able to do the up and to the left visual hierarchy things that we were discussing earlier. All right. Uh, and so a lot of you out there, especially for nonprofits, might not necessarily have professional photographers that you're able to work with. And that's totally okay. I think all of us now, or many of us now, have the, the ability to take really high quality images with our, the little tiny computers that we have in our pockets. Um, but if you don't want to do that, things like Adobe Stock, Pixabay, Unsplash, all of these things that you have access to within Adobe Spark, are going to let you find imagery that's going to work for the message that you're trying to convey. And at the end of the day, that's really what it is. We're, we're trying to grab attention, and visuals and pictures are going to do that. Um, I had a really great question at this, the live version of this webinar that I gave at Adobe Max this past year. Um, it was actually for a construction company. And they were saying, oh, man, like, our images aren't great. Like, they're not exciting. Like, we're just posting pictures of work sites and machinery. And I was like, that's really interesting, actually. There's ways that you can kind of use technology like Spark, like Photoshop, like these other image editors that we have out there to, to apply filters, to, to add visual excitement to those things to use the rule of thirds to make the image much more striking. Um, it, the subject matter doesn't have to be interesting. The way you present it does. Uh, so for those of you out there who are working for nonprofits that maybe don't have the sexiest kind of story that you're trying to tell or, or visuals, like maybe you're in healthcare, for example, that's one we get a lot of questions about people in that space. Like, what do we show? It's not about the, the product always. Sometimes it's about the, the feeling that you're trying to convey. If you're working with a healthcare company, for example, um, ooh, prison ministry is a challenge. Actually, that's a perfect example, Vita. Uh, the reason why is because you are trying to convey a feeling. You're trying to convey success stories. You're trying to talk about the lives that you're changing. And those are the visuals that you want to put out there uh, on your social accounts. Um, Anna Astrid says, what is the rule of third in pictures? Um, I'll go back to an earlier slide here to talk about that a little bit. So in a vertical image, like the one we're looking at right now, think of it as being broken up into different segments. So imagine in this image that we're looking at right now, this is going to be kind of hard to explain maybe. There's two, think of it as there's being two lines that are going down on the vertical, breaking it into three different columns, and then two lines, no, two or three lines, and then lines going down, yeah, like tic-tac-toe lines. Perfect. Thank you so much. Think of it as a tic-tac-toe board. Thank you, Joy, Allison, and Sherry. <laughs> that is a great way of explaining this. You want your subject to fit into that right-hand third of the content, the, the, the bottom section of the tic-tac-toe box and the right-hand section of the tic-tac-toe box. That's one way to do it. You can move this around, too. It's just you want the subject matter to fit into one of the thirds of the tic-tac-toe box that you're breaking it up. And this is just a design convention that has been around for centuries. And for some reason, the human eye is drawn to that very strongly. And if you look at other images um, throughout social media or throughout art and throughout photography, you're going to see that theme come back time and time again. Yet they wanted the subject, as Sherry says, wants to be in the intersections of those tic-tac-toe lines. All right. Perfect. Thank you for that. That was a great. I like this collaborative, uh, collaborative sharing. It's, it's super fun. Let's talk about design inspiration and some of the, the things that we really love for making our social media content really stand out from the rest of the pack. So the noun project. I, I mentioned this a little bit earlier. Um, and this is a resource that I use time and time again, not just for presentations like this, but for social media posts. Uh, people use it for logo design, for example. Um, these over a million icons out there on this platform can be used for commercial purposes. 
Um, I actually pay the $10 a month uh, personally, so I can have access to uh, updating the icons to be any hex color that I want them to be, and downloading them in different types of formats. Uh, but I use them constantly. They're so well done. Uh, and it's just a really great resource for when you don't have a visual to show, being able to search and use an icon that you can use in its place. Designinspiration.net is another really wonderful resource. Um, this is going to give you examples, uh, as you can see here. Um, you can find all different types of uh, nonprofit examples on their website that shows things like social posts or infographics or things that you can use to print out in flyers. Um, all of these are just great for getting an idea of what works, what looks really good if you're not a designer, and for coming up for ideas for people to work with or for different campaigns that you want to run in the future. Um, Jesse says in the comments, should only one picture be used in marketing on social media? Um, I'd like to dig into that a little bit more. Do you mean for one specific campaign? Do you mean for one specific post? Or do you mean for overall? Um, I think if you're doing a campaign, um, finding images that work well together is probably the best way to go about it. You want them to be similar for overall. Um, no, I don't think so. I think, I think finding images that work well together is probably the best thing to do because you don't want it to be visually exhausting to the eye either. If people see the same image over and over, they're going to glaze over it. But finding things that work well together as part of a campaign, I think, makes more sense. Justin says, can you add these icons to subject lines in emails? Um, no. They're, they're not emoji, um, so they don't follow the uh, emoji Unicode standard. Um, so most email clients will not be able to recognize, uh, recognize these icons in email subject lines um, because they're images. So just the same way that you wouldn't be able to put a, a bitmoji, for example, in a subject line as much as I would want to um, because it's a JPEG file or a PNG file, um, you might, that, that wouldn't work from a technical perspective in, in email clients. Um, Nicole says, maybe it will be addressed, but what's the recommendation for post frequency if it's not already defined internally? That is a fantastic question. Um, I'm going to share out some links to our playbooks at the end of the presentation. Um, these are great resources for figuring out what you want your frequency to be. Uh, it depends on the platform, honestly. I think if you're doing a campaign that has a multi-pronged approach where you're doing across multiple social platforms, um, Different platforms kind of require a different level of engagement. Um, so we, we can talk about that a little bit towards the end of the presentation when we talk about uh, resources. Okay. Behance uh, is an Adobe product, um, very similar uh, in, with what we were talking about with design inspiration. Just a great way to figure out like, what you want maybe your look and feel to be, things that you can kind of use as inspiration or as a catalyst for a campaign. Um, just tons of artists also that you can find to potentially work with in the future. So now let's talk a little bit more about um, generating that momentum, um, really figuring out where your audience is and how to find and keep them now that you've figured out what kind of content you want to post out there. Hashtags. So a lot of people understand the concept of hashtags but don't really understand the best way to use them. Um, just a little bit of statistics for you. Uh, Tweets with one or more hashtag are 55% more likely to be retweeted. Just think about that. That is just an easy way to spark additional engagement with your content on social platforms, just by having a hashtag. And a post with at least one Instagram hashtag averages 12.6 more engagement than posts without a hashtag. So why is this? It's because people are better, better empowered to find your content. Think about why you would click on a hashtag. Why would you look for or save a hashtag on Instagram or click on one on LinkedIn or Facebook? It's because you, you resonate with that hashtag and you want to learn more about it and see what that connected conversation is happening across social platforms. It's an incredibly powerful tool. Um, I think especially when you're looking into what your competitors or what other people in, in that space are doing. Um, it's really brilliant to follow someone else's Instagram posts and look at the hashtags that they're using and see the conversation that they're having. And 
not necessarily kind of like ride their coattails, but be part of that conversation. That's kind of the whole point of hashtags is to find one way for, for collectively all of your users and followers and people on social media to be a part of a larger conversation. Deb says, how many hashtags should be used on posts on Instagram and Twitter? Um, that's a really great question. I think when I personally see more than maybe three or four hashtags being used on Twitter, I, I kind of see it as a turnoff. Um, your mileage may vary though. Some people use tons of hashtags and keep them saved in like a, a, a notes app or somewhere where they can go in and change them and update them for, for different kinds of posts. Um, I've talked to some social media marketers or influencers who have different categories of hashtags that they use. So if they're doing something like a, a branded campaign, they have different hashtags versus like a, um, a fashion campaign or a, a public good campaign. Um, they make different hashtag collections. So really see what works best for you. Check out what other people in your space are doing and how their engagement is looking and kind of make that determination for yourself. I think there is definitely a, a limit <laughs> to, to what's kind of in good taste to use because you still want those hashtags to be relevant to the story you're trying to say. For example, if people click on a hashtag and it leads them to your post, but the hashtag doesn't really have to do it all with the message that you're sharing, that could actually be a detriment to the overall conversation that you're trying to build and the authenticity drink that you're trying to create for your brand or nonprofit. So I think we kind of covered why hashtags have power, um, but we should talk about this brand um, feed for a little bit too. Uh, oh, actually, Beth has a really great question. Do you suggest creating your own hashtag or finding ones that are already in use? Um, both, actually. Uh, for example, um, when uh, Spark does certain campaigns, we'll create a unique hashtag so we can follow that conversation across different social platforms without having a lot of bleed in from other conversations. It really helps us kind of narrow in that focus for that campaign. However, if you're trying to be part of a larger conversation, then you want to find those most used hashtags uh, for the audience you're trying to reach. So it can actually be both. Susan says, just wish you would not talk so fast at times. Totally hear you. I'll try to slow it down a little bit. I just get really excited talking about this stuff. So I get pumped. It's exciting. Um, but I understand from a technology perspective, maybe fast is not better for internet webinars. Um, let's take a look at this example uh, for Feed. They did a campaign called Feed Supper. Um, and it's talking about how if, if women and female farmers had the same access to resources as men, the number of hungry in the world could be reduced by 150 million people. So that was a part of the campaign that they were running. And that was a very specific hashtag for that campaign. So if we go into how successful that campaign really was, you can see just from these examples, they're getting an incredible amount of engagement uh, through influencers, people like Reese Witherspoon, uh, Jessica Alba, um, because they were doing these events and able to track this hashtag over social media. I love this example because it, it really shows how a successful hashtag campaign can really uh, can work and create that engagement and that conversation over platforms. So really the top takeaways here for hashtag tips and tricks, do your research. Figure out what people are saying, what those existing conversations are already happening on social media, and jump into that. Be a part of that conversation. You don't always have to start the conversation to be a part of it. Be authentic. Make sure that the hashtags that you're using and sharing are relevant to the content that you're uh, and the conversations that you're trying to create and generate on your own social content, because if you don't, um, as we talked about a little bit earlier, uh, it can actually have a negative impact on your engagement and on the overall sentiment that people have for your nonprofit or for your brand. And really build around that existing community. These conversations are already happening out there. These users and people that you want to tap into to hear your message are already out there on social. You just have to find them and know what platforms and what hashtags 
are going to best serve them. So building a cadence, um, these are some of the tools that we use that really make it much easier to figure out how often you should be posting, um, how often you want to be having these hashtag posts go live. Uh, things like Buffer and Hootsuite, I think many of you already mentioned uh, in the audience here today that you're using tools like these. And they're really wonderful because they give you a lot of tips and guidance on when is the best time to post your social content. So it kind of takes a lot of the guesswork out of that. Um, and I'm talking specifically about what time of day you want to be post posting, what platforms you want to be doing, and they even give you recommendations for the kind of content based on the hashtags that you're using most frequently. You can kind of pull in some of that content that's out there existing on your networks already that you don't necessarily have to build from scratch. Um, we actually, Spark has, uh, has worked with Later to create a Spark plugin um, that I'd be happy to share out later too. So if you're, uh, well, the later, later is the company, but also I will share it out with you later for the stuff on later. <sighs> uh, but it's, it's a really great product um, and it enables you to create content right in Spark and then post it automatically to your, uh, to your sharing calendar in later. And collaboration is also super important. Um, Spark is creating all these new tools that enable you to collaborate uh, with other users in your company. Um, that way you can share and build content together and be able to see uh, what content is coming out in a campaign. Uh, and pretty soon we're going to be launching support for multiple brands. So if you have uh, different brands that you work with or different nonprofits, if you're not working for a specific nonprofit, makes it really easy to create that content um, for all of those different brands and companies you're using. Uh, Kent asks, what tools are these? Um, if we go back a slide, these are tools that enable you to schedule content for social media specifically. So they're going to enable you to take content that you build in a tool like Spark, for example, and then upload it into their content sharing calendar so that you can post it to specific social platforms and actually see what is working best, um, which is really great for figuring out what content is working best for your nonprofit so you can continue to focus on that type of content. Um, do any of these listed have a free option? Uh, Buffer does have a free option, uh, I know. Um, I'd have to look into the other ones. I think there might also be a, uh, a free option for Hootsuite as well. Um, but double check with those. I don't work with those uh, companies specifically um, on a partnership level other than Later. So yeah, and they, a number of people are saying that uh, Later does have a free option as well. These are just some of the ones that, um, oh, and Later gives a 50% discount to nonprofits. Fantastic. Always check with that because a lot of companies do give a free option for nonprofits. So it's important to check in with them too to see what's available to you. So our overall key takeaways for the presentation, uh, remember to show, don't tell. Uh, create these visuals that are going to be thumb stoppers. Make use of things like animations, uh, great contrast between your imagery and your fonts and message um, to really make sure that people understand the message that you're trying to share with them visually. Um, maximize copy and keep it short and sweet. Remember the rule of thirds and that great visual hierarchy of putting the content up into the left. And consistency, curate your social channels. Make sure that your content has that consistent brand voice and look and feel, and keep your content true to your brand. So some more getting started resources that we've created. Um, I created uh, with our content team a creative fitness challenge. This is available for free on YouTube. It's 10 videos. Um, they're all about a minute to a minute and a half long that go through all the different features of Spark and show you how to use them to create really camp compelling social campaigns. Uh, the Spark blog, which Emily has linked to in the chat a few times, um, has tons of great resources, tips and tricks, and ideas uh, for creating social content. And then the Spark playbooks. Now, this is something that we are super excited about that we're, we're kind of uh, testing out to see how people like them and how much benefit they're getting from them. Uh, there's some of our top tip, tips and tricks, as well as a content calendar that day by day will tell you exactly what to make and how to make it in Spark to maximize 
your potential for building a community and getting your message out there using visual storytelling. Um, so we're really excited about these and I want to know how they work. Um, and I'm also really excited to, to update these uh, with more tips and tricks specifically for nonprofits. And that is the bulk of my presentation. We have a couple minutes left for, for questions. Um, and also, uh, yeah, thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you, Veronica. Yeah, so we have, we're getting close to time, so maybe we'll just take about two questions if you guys want to uh, chat them in, and we can ask them. But Veronica did answer a lot of questions along the way. Um, so if you guys want to take a second to ask your questions, let's see what we have here. It sounds like we need a whole webinar on hashtags from, from what I gathered. Um, <laughs> Aaron says, does Spark have a grid uh, to help with the rule of thirds? Uh, yes, we have guidelines in the product. We don't have a rule of thirds uh, in Spark Post, um, but we do have design templates that make use of that, that you can edit the content in those templates to put your own message in them. Selfies, okay or not? Yeah, sure. I mean, I'm not sure why you would want to build a social campaign for your nonprofit around selfies, but if it works for you, go with it. Um, is that image at the end from the noun project? Yeah, that last slide that I used, it is absolutely from the noun project. <laughs> um, yeah, there's actually a, a Mac desktop app um, for noun project that I use. Um, we don't have a desktop app for Spark. Um, it's a web app. So if you go to spark.adobe.com, you'll be able to log in and access all of your projects. Uh, it's all cloud synced. Um, so it's, it's great to go back and forth between the iOS and Android app and the web app. Awesome. Rachel so says, is it we're, meaningful we're, to have oh, we're at time? Okay. Oh, yeah. Do you want to take this? If you want to take this last one, and then I'll, I'll go ahead and close out. Well, I was going to say, if you want to tweet at me with your questions, um, my username is at Veronica, just my first name. Um, posted right there. I'm happy to continue the conversation there um, and answer some of your questions. Um, and just use the hashtag Adobe Spark so I can follow them or the hashtag that you guys had for, for the TechSoup uh, webinars as well. Awesome. Thank you so much, Veronica. Um, so we have just a couple more slides before we close out. So if you guys don't mind, it's always really nice for us to, to hear you know, kind of what you learned. Um, we have a post-event survey, if you guys don't mind taking a couple of minutes. And we also love hearing it in our chat box. So if you're still on, on the line and you want to share with Veronica uh, one thing that you learned today, it'll be fun for her to see that. Um, also, we're on social media. So if you're on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, or Twitter, feel free to give us a follow. We also have the TechSoup blog, which is blog.techsoup.org. And we have one more webinar this year, so if you guys are interested in joining, we are doing three ways starting a podcast can help your nonprofit grow. We also have our TechSoup courses and TechSoup services. We offer a 10% discount for uh, the TechSoup course of your choice, and my colleague Stephen will be messaging out um, that code, and then we'll also send it in the follow-up email. And also, I just want to say thank you to Veronica, and thank you to the audience. We did have a minor technical difficulty, but I think in the end it turned out a lot better because it sounded much clearer. So thank you for uh, your patience to the audience and, and thanks to Veronica for, for switching. And uh, yeah, thank you to our, our sponsor, ReadyTalk, and Stephen and Emily on the back end for helping. <laughs>